Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, guys, what I'll do is I'll demo the mental health uh, chat bot that we are using to. Uh, the purpose of the chat bot is as follows. So, uh, usually, what happens is a patient uh, visits a clinician. Uh, the clinician, during their interaction with the patient, they create a sort of treatment plan. And then the treatment plan is uh, followed by the patient or not followed by the patient. And they report any uh, findings and um, new things they may discover while following that plan, treatment plan in the next meeting with the a clinician. Uh, so what happens in this setting is that uh, the clinician is not able to give enough a personalized attention to every single patient because there are far more patients than there are clinicians available. So uh, there is a need right now and an opportunity for AI-assisted uh, patient self-management. What I mean by that is that in that interim period between which the patient first visited a clinician and gets to visit the clinician at a later date, uh, whenever the appointment is available, this bot will uh, come in and help the patient manage their mental health better. As uh, why would that be necessary? Because when there are long delays between the between visits, the patient may uh, have struggle with uh, their mental health because they need a repeated um, appraisal in between to uh, stick to the plan. So with that prelude, uh, I'll start the demo. So at any point, just stop me if you have a question. So here is a rough execution flow for the chatbot. So uh, what the data structure that we use to uh, store a user's profile information, a patient's profile information is a knowledge graph. So for example, uh, you can see on the left, it's just an illustration. The information contained in that is, you'll see uh, more detailed examples of in later slides. But for now, so it's a knowledge graph relations in on the edges and entities on the um, nodes. And so in addition to that, you have clinical guidelines. So you can picture the clinical guidelines as path constraints. For example, this learning algorithm that you see on the right here, uh, think of that as algorithm X, Y, Z for now. So one outcome of that algorithm might look as follows. So if patient is diagnosed with depression, then uh, um, talk to them about it, right? Uh, so what does that look like for in the computer program? If a path in the knowledge graph is activated, then execute some form of intervention action. Now, what can the clinical guidelines do? If that path is activated, the uh, function XYZ and the function XYZ wants to execute, say, appraisal as the intervention action. And the clinical guidelines is saying, no, instead execute information gathering. So it acts as a constraint that is provided by the medical expert to weigh information gathering as an intervention strategy in that scenario over what the function XYZ uh, learned, which was appraisal. So in other words, the clinical guidelines you can think of as a path constraints over the knowledge graph. So now having constrained the learning algorithm that way, when at any time step it predicts some action, which is appraisal or uh, all the things that you see on your screen, uh, whether or not at that time step it was the right action uh, is uh, uh, necessary for the bot to take into account during its refinement process. This is during development and research. So there you see that there is this patient feedback that is taken into account to, for the refinement process. But at the same time, the patient is not an expert. So the refinement process also takes as input the knowledge graph information as well as clinical guidelines. So all those three work synergistically to provide the optimal refinement strategy for that um, algorithm XYZ. Um, and the, uh, under the hood, the setup is a reinforcement learning setup. So where reinforcement is just another word for feedback, reinforcement learning means uh, at a, uh, learning from feedback. So now, uh, okay. 
So one by one, the tasks that you saw in the first slide, I'll go through some of them. So here is uh, initial assessment like the patient uh, would encounter during their first visit to the uh, clinician's office. So what if a bot did this? So this is examples from the uh, text generation bot, uh, GPT-2. I'm sure maybe some of you have heard of that. So uh, the bot is, starts with the, you feel nervous and the patient says more than half the days. And the bot stopped three choices for the next question. So top three is decided by some top case sampling from the generation. Um, you can see on the screen. So uh, when we presented these questions to our clinical uh, clinician partners, they said that uh, these contain harmful words. For example, you don't just go up to someone and ask them, are you feeling destructive? Or you don't just go up to someone and ask them, is there something extreme you might do to yourself? Right? Those, you have to have a more tactful approach to uh, getting that information from the patient. So that tactful approach uh, is known as process knowledge. Uh, and now the question is, how do we infuse process knowledge of how to ask questions into uh, AI chatbot? Uh, uh, just clarification, Kaushik. Uh, the tactful approach. I I would I, I use process knowledge uh, to indicate uh, the clinical guideline, and uh, you know so uh, uh, something that uh, uh, you know asking for potentially feeling destructive would be outside of the clinical guideline in the sense that that concept is not something that would be uh, uh, asked uh, as part of the guideline. So in that sense, that is how I would avoid that. Are you, is that what you are saying or do you mean something else? That is what I'm saying. Okay. So I, I guess that is what I mean by tactful approach. So uh, I am using tactful approach as short for tactic where the tactic has to involve both wording your sentences, right? As well as following medical guidelines. And it can happen that those medical guidelines do actually look for uh, concepts such as if the patient is feeling destructive or extreme, but they don't do it in that manner. You'll see what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. So um, here is an example of a medical guideline that wants to understand the state of depression in a uh, patient that is uh, suffering from some mild form of mental illness. Um, so so uh, let me add this for the students. Uh, um, what happens is that if you are, uh, you know, majority of the new chatbots are being written by using a, a large language model, but um, the la language model by itself would not have the specific um, clinical knowledge, uh, or uh, in this case, uh, you know, and also what we also call process knowledge, uh, saying that these are the nine considerations uh, and relevant questions that you uh, that you must uh, ver ver verify, talk about with the patient. Uh, before you can um, adequately assess depression in the patient. So that is a, a process knowledge that is missing from the uh, you know, current ways of building uh, knowledge graph, uh, sorry, uh, chatbots. And hence, uh, clearly they would not be uh, following a well, clinically valid process. And hence that would not be acceptable as a way to uh, talk, you know, diagnose uh, uh, depression. Go ahead. Right. So uh, as we saw in the earlier slide, uh, the, the GPT-2 generated questions like, are you feeling destructive? Now, if you uh, think about a depressed person, maybe you are, you are all not that intimately familiar with how a depressed person's mind works, but they, uh, when they're saying that they're feeling down depressed or hopeless, it is not uncommon for them to in the same vein at a later point in their sentence or uh, uh, text, say that uh, I'm feeling kind of destructive. So, uh, but that if you use a, a language model to compare the two, say using for now rudimentary cosine similarity, destructive, uh, feeling kind of destructive will be mapped to um, uh, feeling down or depressed. But uh, the word destructive does not appear if a, a language model takes into account that similarity match, but generates the left-hand side of the match in its text, if that makes sense. So that is uh, 
the rough idea so when the la language model that is incorporating process knowledge uh, does encounter uh, words like destructive and thing it still uh, molds the sentences in such a way that the phq9 um, question uh, intentions are satisfied they want to know that information but the destructive thing the, the, the things that the patients say such as destructive and other things sometimes they say that nonchalantly and that can still be handled uh, uh, to get the information in on the right hand side uh, if you leave the uh, bot as it is, the, say using a GPT-2 model, uh, out of the box language model, which was never built for domain specific understanding of this sort, uh, it can run right and do things like you saw in the previous slide. And you'll see even more alarming ex examples of how it can run right in future slides. Um, so yeah, so taking things up a notch, here is a person who is actually joking about this. And this is uh, very difficult for a bot to understand. And it absolutely shouldn't have to deal with this kind of scenario. This person is, uh, as, uh, I have cropped some part of his sentences, but uh, it's, he says, haha, a lot of places. So uh, he's just sarcastically say, uh, hinting that th there's a gun on their lap, they're not on a ledge, they might kill themselves, something like that. But here are GPT-2's um, responses. Gun sounds alarming. What is on your mind is fine. Uh, the next two are not appropriate. Uh, first of all, before even generating responses, there should be a controller in an AI algorithm that is deployed in this setting that should decide whether or not to respond at all to something like this. Um, so using a process knowledge from the CSSR. CSSR stands for Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. There are a bunch of concepts which if some uh, similarity match triggers, uh, then the language model should incorporate that information to say that there are concepts. So question one is, I haven't written it out explicitly, but it is the concept wish to be there. Question two is the concept non-specific active suicidal thoughts. Uh, so this program, once you infuse process knowledge into it, it can find those concepts. And now you might have a rule that is, that is the path constraints I was talking about at the very beginning, which says that don't respond at all, right? Just alert the care provider or take some kind of emergency intervention or response strategy. Um, okay, so what happens now? Once that intervention uh, happens offline, you have new set of providers. Um, the provider uh, who is qualified to deal with the situation that extreme has dealt with it somehow offline and there are no new notes. So uh, the user is taking a particular medication. Uh, here is where the AI system can help even the provider. They did not tell the provider that they take the present. But during their inter interactions with the uh, AI system, this knowledge is present. But the uh, provider did tell the uh, right in their discharge summary that they take fluoxetine because fluoxetine is relevant to mental health, right? They would not write medicines that they take or not take that is not relevant to mental health unless there is some specific cause to do that. So those uh, in in such scenarios, it is uh, during patient interaction. Sometimes the knowledge graph captures information like takes the person. Now here is where the interesting part comes. First of all, from the uh, external knowledge bases that are already out there, like Mayo Clinic uh, databases, MedRT, UMLS, all of these things. These are large databases built by humans that contain information pertaining to drugs, their side effects, their general information and their counter actions. So using that kind of information, here the key thing to notice is the counter action. Uh, the bot can inform its further conversation. First, the um, boilerplate stuff, because they're saying fluoxetine and the task is medication reminder. We don't come to troubleshooting unless there is a necessity for that yet just ask them about fluoxetine related questions. Prescription uh, has enough refills that is asked because the bot knows that fluoxetine is used, uh, I mean, is available only through prescription. Uh, so when the person responds with they're not helping, now this is 
a negative response. So now the bot can so, see. Uh, so huh? if you want to look at the question and to ask, I have the detail, I have some detailed answer, but I want you to first respond to this. Sure, okay. Uh, um, yeah, so my question is, uh, you were explaining about the responses, right, uh, from the bot. And then you mentioned that one can be valid response and another are invalid ones. Now, uh, you know, uh, so, so, uh, just thinking uh, in the direction that uh, the bot responds looking at someone's personality and that might help them to maybe come out of depression. Can something like that be built using AI? So uh, taking a step back, if you look mm -hmm. at the data structures being used here, right? The knowledge graph that we are using can encode personal patient information. Right now, what does personal patient information look like? Uh, information coming from uh, a provider notes to from interactions with the chatbot itself. Now, okay. if you want uh, personal information beyond that, and it appears in these two sources, provider notes or interactions with the chatbot, then it will be there. Right. If you want explicitly, if you want to for the knowledge graph to explicitly encode other kinds of personal information, it is only a question of providing a resource that contains that kind of personal information. So, so fundamentally, so we call this personalized health knowledge graph. Uh, it um, uh, it essentially uh, gets the scope of the knowledge uh, from uh, the subject that this not. Uh, a virtual agent or chatbot has supposed to be able to talk about, which is in this case, mental health. Secondly, and you know, so you have general medical knowledge and you have mental health specific knowledge, which is coming from uh, a resource called DSM-5, which is what all the uh, medical doctors who uh, we specialize in mental health use to uh, get trained in clinical thing. Although there are variations, so it's not so cut and dry, but uh, we are using DSM-5. Uh, so, you know, some, some doctors may not fully believe in DSM-5 and they have other guidelines, but the guideline for mental health, such as what is called OCD, what is called anxiety, what is the severity of anxiety, all these questions and their answers and their, you know, you are, all that is described. Think about it as a textbook for mental health professional. And from that, we create the knowledge graph. So you have domain knowledge graph. Uh, you have the clinical guideline, meaning the set of questions that you go through. Uh, those nine questions for depression, that is uh, what is the clinical guideline. Then you have, um, uh, it says personalized. So what is personalized here? Uh, that uh, when the patient sees the doctor at the end of the visit, uh, typically in the chronic health disease or something, you see the doctor once every three or six months, that's a routine visit. And then as needed, in case things are going you know, bad or worse, uh, then you can see the doctor between this interval. But when you see the doctor, uh, the, the, at the end of the visit, doctor gives you, uh, uh, you know, instructions what to follow. Uh, it, it is called discharge summary. Uh, you know, so in the US, you get a, a printout uh, of all the discussion, all the conversation that you had, a summary of that, and then what doctors, uh, you know, recommend saying the, all the medication and information, uh, you know, saying take this thing two times a day, that is printed out and given. Uh, it will say uh, in the case of medical thing, do meditation, you know, as needed, whatever it is. That discharge summary information is converted into uh, knowledge, structured knowledge, and added to this personalized knowledge graph for that particular patient. And further on, as the chatbot that uses this knowledge graph, so as I described now, communicates with the uh, uh, patient on, let's say, daily basis, once a day, then whatever is learned there is also added to the knowledge graph. That last part may not be part of the, our system now, but uh, you know, like a doctor uh, would be, if you go and see a doctor, the doctor would look up your past records and say, last time you saw me, this was a thing. And I cha changed the medication this way. Before that, this happened. That historical knowledge for that particular patient is necessary uh, and is useful in the diet, you know, whatever plan that doctor does. See, the, that same thing we would like to use in the chatbot. So it is also aware of uh, the past history 
and it becomes individualized, right? So doctor does not doctor does not forget that you had seen the uh, uh, you know the patient has seen him or her uh, you know a month ago. Doctor knows that, or at least refers to the uh, uh, you know records, medical record. That general idea also is something that we want to be able to add to the um, uh, personalized knowledge graph. So that is generally the concept of personalized self knowledge graph, which is a structured representation of all the uh, knowledge uh, 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 necessary to serve that specific patient or person. Take over. Yeah, got it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so uh, early on. Uh, I believe personality uh, is very important while dealing with this depressed uh, people. So long back, uh, we had a you know, good project with Japan. And Japan is the you know most suicidal country in the world. I mean, they have a lot of suicidal rates. So personality, I mean, see, uh, many times, uh, you know, psychiatrists actually divert people. Let's say you are a very creative person, so, you know, divert towards you know, you take more creativity, you're open person, do more social engaging and so on. So personality, if we can somehow add or learn from the previous conversation, I mean, now what kind of personality? I mean, is it big five enough? Or we can look at the mayor's one, or we can look at the disc one. So there are, you know, disc is very popular in the medical domain. And then uh, add it to the knowledge graph and then probably uh, accordingly take into account that information and, and generate might be more more personalized yeah right so and uh, i just to stitch that together like what dr das just said um if you had personalized a uh, personality type right say you i'm not super familiar with personality types but let's say that intj structure and things that you have in personality tests sometimes and you add that that user has personality type INTJ, right? Uh, and the, the bot uses that additional information from the knowledge graph. And if that personality type encoding helps the outcome, then good. If it doesn't, uh, then it's still there. Yeah, so the learning algorithms task is uh, to uh, recognize uh, paths in the knowledge graph that enable uh, useful outcomes. But the knowledge yeah. graph will the list, yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, has it been observed in any research that personality of a person changes from time to time? Uh, sorry, sorry to have... we, are, we are probably diverting the topic, but let me just very quickly close this chapter. Saying, so, okay, see, psychology is a, uh, I mean, sometimes, I mean, it's not my uh, code, but, you know, it's a ill-defined science, okay? Because you are trying to understand human brain by some external behavior, and this mapping all the time is not proper. Okay, so yes, the, so there are two school of thoughts in the psychology. People say yes, personality do change, and some people say no. After certain age, it does not change. Mm -hmm. So the second school of thought is actually winning you know, because majority of you know, people actually fall into that bucket. But it does not mean that there is no such thing that you know people don't change their personality given circumstances and all this kind of thing. So there is no concrete answer. Sure, I got it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So earlier on, I mentioned uh, in that execution flow that the the learning algorithm also takes clinical guidance. Now, if you see here that. Um, there are a lot of things going on. For example, when the patient says they are not helping, uh, this is a negative sentiment. So let's say sentiment classifier classifies this as negative sentiment. Now in the clinical guideline, there might be a path constraint saying that there are all these paths in the knowledge graph, right? Now the path constraint says that when you detect a negative sentiment in the response, uh, highlight X, Y, Z relationships. So because the guidelines are written by humans and they know which relationships have negative uh, connotations. So is available use works by belongs to is not the, uh, present in the guideline, but counteracts is. So that part is highlighted when a negative sentiment is detected. Now, what do you do with that? So precondition for highlighting a knowledge path is de detecting negative sentiment. Post effect is what do you do with that after highlighting. 
post effect is alert the provider of possible uh, adverse reaction right so all of that uh, is how a clinical guideline a knowledge graph is fed into the learning algorithm which decides the post effect right um so continuing um yeah so that is super useful to a care provider i know this bot is meant to help patients manage themselves but at the back end new information that arises like the counteraction with the presidon uh, is a possible cause for a negative sentiment detected in the patient that because the provider has provided clinical guidelines uh, beforehand they did not have to model the entire world they they bootstrap the algorithm or the chatbot with the ability to discover hypotheses that it can present to the provider at a later date from a dashboard setter as a dashboard visualization or some such thing that makes sense to me right <clears throat> so yeah the hypothesis that the uh, presidon um, is has adverse reaction with fluoxetine causing this negative sentiment can further be expanded again that will depend on the clinical guidelines needed so what can we do to help it alert the doctor of possible counteraction with the thyrsidone affecting uh, irregular heartbeat because heartbeat was detected in the text and negative sentiment was detected in the text so you see how it can get richer and richer the uh, hypothesis constructed by the chatbot that can benefit the care provider as well moving on um, so once that care provider is alerted with the possible hypothesis of course they have to vet it and then uh, after vetting it they uh, do another offline intervention with the patient and now there is a new set of provider which which says that the person needs to exercise five days a week at least right so the bot is now supposed to uh, perform its self appraisal function which is to confirm that they have done uh, they have adhered to the treatment plan and then if they have then just praise them right uh yeah so roughly you see those are the some of the natural language things um uh, processing challenges that we are dealing with in the chatbot setup uh and now going back to the first slide uh each of these components have their own set of challenges the reinforcement learning setup has its own set of challenges so the reason i did this demo for you guys is that now you can tell me offline maybe uh, of course questions i'll take right now which of these specifically you want to get involved in and i can direct uh, you towards papers uh, for those specific tasks 